there's some mapping from human behavior to human desire slash values. We don't really know what it is. As you say, our actions and our words often diverge. One of the things that I take away from the history of the law is, thank God it's an iterative, ongoing process. <laughs> you know, because we... Yeah. Every society looks back on the society of a century prior and thinks of them as kind of moral barbarians. And there's no reason to think that <laughs> yeah. we've reached the end of that process. How many fundamental breakthroughs are needed between here and AGI versus just scaling up the stuff that we have? And the, the rough consensus answer is like... This is Brain Inspired. from taking over that's the sci-fi question uh emphasis on the fi part of science fiction hey guys i'm paul middlebrooks welcome to the show i'm not particularly concerned with that question but it is reasonable to ask as we build better ai systems to make our lives better and easier how would we build ai to make our lives better and easier this is known uh, as the alignment problem as brian christian states it the alignment problem is the problem in machine learning of whether the systems that we are training by examples are really learning what we think they're learning or what we intend for them to be learning, and whether their behavior when we deploy those systems is going to match what we uh, had in mind or what we wanted uh, the system to do. Brian has a new book called The Alignment Problem, Machine Learning and Human Values. This is his third book. Uh, he wrote The Most Human Human, which is about the Turing test competition and Brian's attempt to convince people that he's human. <laughs> and he co-wrote Algorithms to Live By with Tom Griffiths, um, which um, Tom and I discussed back on episode 56. In Brian's latest book, The Alignment Problem, uh, he lays out the issues confronting us now with how to move forward if we want to build truly useful AI. And to do that, he relates the history of AI uh, many of the stories and words of the people who have made and you know continue to make that history. And he describes how uh, modern machine learning works and how it relates to potential problems and solutions for the alignment problem. In this episode, we discuss how that progress is playing out, um, who is and who should be making that progress, some of the techniques offered as solutions, like inverse reinforcement learning, which is the idea of letting an AI agent uh, infer what we're trying to do so that it can help us do it. So you have an AI agent that observes your behavior uh, and does its best to form an objective function that matches your desires. We also talk about the dilemma of simply knowing what our own values are or you know, what we want our values to be so that the machines can help us attain those values. And Brian tells uh, many of the stories that he uses as examples throughout the book. Show notes are at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 98. If you value Brain Inspired, <laughs> you can support it on Patreon. So all the full episodes are posted through Patreon. And you can also join our fledgling little Discord community, where, for example, this month we're discussing a talk about AI consciousness by Yashua Bengio. BrainInspired.co is the place to find the Patreon link. Be safe out there and watch out for those killer robots. I do realize that this is the moment in the movie where I get decapitated by the robots that I'm making fun of. <laughs> I seem safe for now, at least. Here's Brian. Brian, I, I managed to create 97 uh, podcast episodes before having to talk about AI ethics. I say having to talk or getting to talk about ethics in artificial <laughs> intelligence. So uh, your hope that I, I know that you would hope yes. that writing the book would, would generate more conversations and inspire people to go into this field. Uh, it seems to be perhaps coming true. What do you think? It certainly has gone in a remarkably short time from being a sort of fringe area or a kind of marginal and, and to some mm -hmm. degree taboo area within um, computer science itself to being one of the arguably the fastest growing 
part of the field. Um, and that's happened in a, about a five-year span. So, it's been a, a very remarkable transformation of computer science itself. You know, if you look at what people are writing their theses about or what sort of workshops are happening at the big conferences, um, it's been a big transformation. And that's part of the story that I wanted to tell in the book was kind of this this first generation, if you will, of grad students coming up the ranks sort of explicitly focused on these questions. Well, you you say it's been about five years, which I know is an approximation, but do I have it correct? Did you start working on the book f- about four years ago? So if, that, if that's, that's true, then you were really, uh, you really lived through this growth. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, I, um, I started thinking about some of these questions of, you know, safety in AI going back to around 2014. People like, you know, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk were saying these things in the press. There's a, a funny anecdote where I went to a Silicon Valley um, investor book club and Elon Musk was there and he cornered me and, you know, made me give him, you know, a good reason why we shouldn't be worried about AI safety. And I was unable to provide a satisfactory response, which it got me thinking um, about it. And over the course of 2014, we started to see um, not just high profile people in general, but people like, for example, Stuart Russell you know, leaders within the theoretical computer science community starting to come out and say, yeah, there is something here. You know, we need to start thinking about this as computer scientists. So, that really got my attention. But at that time, I was still finishing writing algorithms to live by. So, that was my Mm -hmm. primary bandwidth was kind of taken up by that. That book came out in the spring of 2016. And so, I was starting to think about, you know, what was going to come next. And by the summer of 2016, that's when we started to see a combination of things. You know, on the one hand, you had really the beginning of this AI safety ecosystem emerging. There had been the Future of Life Institute conference in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. There was kind of an increasing focus uh, at places like NeurIPS and so forth, Um, places like Center for Human Compatible AI at Berkeley, um, OpenAI, uh, all getting founded in sort of the 2015-2016 period. And then you also had, in the summer of 2016, an explosion of interest in the sort of fat ML now rebranded to fact, um, fairness, accountability, transparency community. That was really kicking off. You had the ProPublica article about the um, criminal justice risk assessment score that came out in the summer of 2016. So, suddenly everyone's thinking about what's the proper objective function to measure fairness and all these things. So, yeah. it really felt to me that those two those two sets of concerns, the longer term uh, technical AI safety or even the existential risk um, set of issues, on the one hand, that was becoming increasingly grounded in an actual scientific agenda. And on the other hand, you had these present day risks, these sort of ethical, uh, you know, accountability, transparency risks that were galvanizing their own community and that community was becoming increasingly technical. Um, and so, it felt like these these two sets of concerns and these two kind of responses that were being mobilized in distinct but related communities were really on a collision course. Um, and so, that's really what convinced me that there was a single story here that kind of united those narratives together. So, yeah, it was really the late summer, early fall of 2016 that I began working on the book in earnest, and uh, a lot has happened since then, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, in earnest, you did work on it. I mean, so just to, you know, describe the book a little bit, uh, much of it is devoted to describing, you know, the history of AI, of AI um, with the stories of the people that have worked on it and are working on it, um, often in their own words, which is, you know, just great. Uh, many of them, you know, have shifted from being experts just in AI have shifted part of their focus, or in some cases, a lot of their focus on working on this, this uh, AI, the AI ethics uh, issues. And and along the way, you also give the, you know, broad and sometimes pretty technically demanding, I wouldn't say demanding because, well, it depends on who you are, I suppose, but, but descriptions of how the technology actually works. And um, that sort of meshing of all these different elements really stood out to me, but I hadn't seen someone tie in the the technicalities of the way that AI works and tie that in to the ex- ethics part. So w- w- with skill as you did. So nice job there. 
<laughs> nice job on the book. In I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it was a major, it was a major endeavor and, <laughs> you know, I ended up doing something approximating a hundred formal interviews and, you know, many, many hundred uh, uh, sort of informal conversations. Yeah. And yeah. it was also, um, you know, archival research. I ended up going to the American Philosophical Institute in uh, Philadelphia and looking through Warren McCulloch's, um, you know, correspondence. And I was working with the Bertrand Russell archives and all sorts of things. Um, and I wanted to pull together, you know, as you say, this deeply rooted historical story, some of which was very surprising to me. I did not know, for example, that Walter Pitts, when he was working on that famous McCulloch and Pitts paper in 1942, was a homeless teenager um, that Warren McCulloch had taken in as sort of a foster parent. Um, so, there were all these little, you know, deeply human moments that, that jumped out um, of the history. But as you say, also, you know, I wanted to paint a portrait of the field as it stands today through the actual perspectives and words of of the people on the front lines. Um, And I also, at the same time, wanted to give a kind of curriculum in machine learning and in some of these open problems. Because I do think, you know, for there's a there's a huge appetite for people trying to get into this area, people who already have a certain technical background or you know, even people who are undergrads or high school students, you know, getting excited about this. And I wanted to, you know, offer a little bit of a, a, a roadmap to that area for people who want to get involved. And I also think there's a lot of room for people who self-identify as non-technical, hmm. who need some kind of intuition. You know, maybe you're a policymaker, maybe you are a judge or something. You've been on the bench for 20 years. Now, suddenly... Uh, a new regulation gets passed and now all of your, um, you know, arraignment hearings are being given this algorithmic risk assessment score. And you're expected to have some kind of intuition about when that score is more trustworthy than other times. Um, but you've never really thought about machine learning, you know, in your whole life. So, right. I think this is becoming uh, kind of a core part of the curriculum for, for citizenship, you know, in the, in the 21st century. So, I, I think the technical grounding is important. Well, I, I want to come back to that actually in just just a, a couple minutes, you know how how to actually enter in the field and who the right people are, et cetera. But just I mean, just before we kind of dive into like the bigger issues, so the much of the book is stories, like you were just talking about, um, and you excel at communicating those stories. So I have kind of a meta question for you. So um, people uh-huh. like Patrick uh, Winston um, have you know advocated that. Well, in Patrick Winston's case, it's called the strong story hypothesis, but there have been others that have advocated this idea that storytelling itself is, you know, and understanding uh, a storytelling is central uh, to human intelligence. And I wonder how you feel about that. How important, you know, having written a book and, and you did this in The Most Human Human as well, your first book, where you really embed the... Um, the narrative, well, the the ideas within a narrative and within story, a story and many stories, uh, and and that commun- as you know, that communicates. There's nothing like a good story that communicates uh, ideas. So I'm just curious what you think of that overall picture of storytelling as being central to human intelligence. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm not I'm not familiar with the actual literature that you're referring to, so I can't sure. speak to a, a specific, um, you know. A, argument or claim there but it must feel right though (laughs) it feels right it feels right i mean i do think that um you know narrative making there's something um intrinsic to the experience of consciousness that you know to turn experiences into a narrative and to give give it a shape give it a sense of you know meaning um that's a big part of what brains do and i think there's something, you know, arguably central about that role in consciousness, you know, this idea of the mm. the interpreter, as some people call it. Um, I also think, I mean, as far as being a writer, someone recently said to me, stories are the file system of the human brain, you know, that mm-hmm. that is how the brain retains information and if you don't turn something into a story, 
your reader's going to have to turn it into a story themselves in order to retain right. it. And so, you might as well do that work for them so that the story they retain is the one that you intended. I think that's broadly right. Um, and so, you know, that's a big part of what I what I wanted to do in the book was not just to make an argument about AI safety or something like this, but to offer people these vignettes that are hopefully um, both more colorful, more engaging, but also stickier. Um, yeah. And so, you know, yeah. people people come up to me years later and say like, oh, yeah, it's the it's like that pneumonia thing or, you know, it's like this or it's right. like that. And I think that's a big part of what we do is we sort of pattern match against these kind of prototypes. And so, you, if you can furnish someone with these prototypical stories, then their ability to recognize situations um, and map them back to that, I think, is a, a really powerful asset. Yeah, I mean, even something as simple as the Walter Pitts, um, you know, his sort of life that you describe of being homeless and then being taken in by McCulloch, also being disappointed later on to learn that their logic units don't, uh, you know, really f uh, map onto what brains are actually doing. And then even to the point of becoming a, an alcoholic and dying in his mid, was it mid forties? I don't remember the particular age, yeah, but yeah. Mm -hmm. those sort those sorts of things are just just for some reason make it so easy to lock in and open up. Oh yes, that's the key to like thinking about what he actually did. <laughs> you know, these somewhat irrelevant mm -hmm. things about his life uh, are somehow key to unlocking the knowledge of what he provided. You know, the knowledge that he provided and things that he worked on. Just an interesting, interesting thing that you that you exploit very well, sir. All right, so. <laughs> Thank Let's you. Talk. I appreciate that. <laughs> so I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to ask you this just to just to get in. So Brian, what is the alignment problem? The alignment problem is the problem in machine learning of whether the systems that we are training by examples are really learning what we think they're learning or what we intend for them to be learning, and whether their behavior when we deploy those systems is going to match what we. Uh, had in mind or what we wanted uh, the system to do. And so that that is a fear that goes back to Norbert Wiener from MIT cyberneticist, uh, you know, in the 1960s, who articulated this very well um, in an essay from uh, 1960, and has more recently, I think, become an acute concern among the actual machine learning community. Well, th see, that's an interesting thing to me, because I guess it, you know, you kind of think of ethicists as being a separate population from the people working in the trenches on the technical details. But what you're saying is that, you know, the, these ideas about ethics and things like explainability and interpretability um, in AI are becoming interesting in themselves to the, to the AI workers, or at least a, a subset of those. Is that the, really the case? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, with uh, interpretability and explainability, I mean, it's an interesting... To me, this is a very interesting part of the field because, in part, a lot of the a lot of the scientific impetus is actually coming from regulators. Um, so you have uh, the GDPR, which was uh, passed in the European Union, in, I think 2016, and went into effect in 2018. I mean, we're still working out the actual case law, but mm. uh, it has this, you know, so-called right to an explanation. And at the time, particularly when the regulation was passed, a lot of people in the field were saying, well, wait a minute, you know, getting a satisfactory explanation out of a deep neural network is is an open scientific research problem. And now right. you're saying this is a regulatory requirement, you know? And um, in particular, I, re I remember a lawyer for one of the big tech companies talking about meeting with EU regulators and making this complaint. And the regulators were unmoved and said, well, that's why the law doesn't go into effect for two years. You have two years to figure it out. So, <laughs> you know, get to work. Um, you know, science doesn't always work uh, on schedule like that. Um, but yeah. you had a similar thing was happening uh, in the United States um, in the, de the Defense Department. You had people, um, analysts in the intelligence community who would get these reports that would say, you know, based on this convolutional net, uh, you know, analyzing this grainy satellite photo, we're pretty sure this is a, you know, ammunition depot and, you know, sign on the dotted line to strike it with some kind of, you know, attack. And these people would have to actually authorize these things personally. And mm. we're saying, no, wait a minute. I don't, I don't really know what I'm signing here. I don't necessarily yeah. feel comfortable with that. And so that's part of how DARPA got interested in that. And so, 
I think, I mean, I think it's an interesting case study where we think of regulation as, you know, typically having a purely stifling effect. But in this case, right. um, the regulatory requirement was really generative for a lot of work to happen in a short period of time. But I think this is, um, to my mind, one of the most interesting and exciting parts of the field is we really are making um, strides into finding model architectures that are ideally interpretable and explainable without sacrificing performance. And that's kind of the uh, the holy grail. I mean, do you think that it's important? Well, rather, how important do you think it is for someone to understand, you know, the nuts and bolts, uh, the technicalities of deep learning nets and other AI endeavors to address the alignment problem or to work on that alignment problem? Do, do alignment problem ethicists and workers need to be AI experts? I certainly think some of them do. Um, I don't think all of them do. I mean, I think part part of the story that I try to portray is that this is really going to draw on a wide range of expertise that yeah. no single person has or there's no single path, you know, of training that's going to give you all of those requisite skills. So, I think it it is going to take a little bit of everything. You know, going back to this point about interpretability, I mean, part of what I think is exciting about this area is that there are methods that can be developed by the people with the deeper technical knowledge that enable people with less technical knowledge to still be able to understand what the model seems to be doing. So, I'm thinking about you know, people like Chris Ola and some of his former collaborators at OpenAI and Google Brain, you know, developing methods where an image classification model, you can just show it a picture of static and say, essentially fine, fine tune the static until it maximizes a category label. Um, and so, you can get it to generate these kind of hallucinated super stimuli. Um, of, you know, what is the, the ultimate, you know, the, the maximally banana-like image or the maximally uh, dog-like image. And this is kind of aesthetically fascinating. It's also a sanity check on the model. And it can be used for things like bias and fairness, right? So, if you ask it mm-hmm. to generate faces and all the faces are white men, then that tells you something might be weird. Um, in their case, they used it to generate images of barbells and all of the barbells had a disembodied muscular arm coming out of them. Yeah. <laughs> and it looks very surreal. Um, but that tells you that the model might not generalize to barbells that are on the ground or barbells that are on a rack. Um, now, in that particular example, that I can't, it's hard to think of a high stakes case of recognizing right. <laughs> a barbell, but, you know, superimpose that onto a self-driving car, not recognizing a cyclist or something like that, and it could be a real issue. Um, and there's, you know, there's a, a recent technique called TCAV, which stands for Testing with Concept Activation Vectors that was developed by Bean Kim at Google Brain. And this uses yeah. kind of high level human concepts. So, under the hood, you are looking at the internal activations of a model. The hidden units. Exactly. And you're trying to find patterns in the activation of the hidden units when they recognize any, anything that a human could identify as a high-level concept. Um, so, it could be a man, a coat, a car, the color red, mm-hmm. whatever it is. And then you look at whether those hidden activations are present when it makes a, another classification. And so, you can determine the, you know, to a rough approximation, the relevance of some of those more um, primary features to some higher-level classification. So, you can say... Um, you know, when when it's classifying someone as a doctor, uh, how important is the white lab coat? How important is the stethoscope, um, et cetera? And if it turns out that being male is very important, then you have a sort of a bias issue. Um, one of the studies that Bean Kim did with some of Google's models involved fire trucks. And it turned out that in all of the models she was looking at, uh, the color red was intrinsic to something being categorized as a fire truck. And this then becomes a safety issue because fire trucks are red in the U.S. almost exclusively. But in Australia, they're white and neon yellow. So, 
a model like that probably wouldn't be safe on the streets to deploy in Australia. So I think right. some of some of those methods are, you know, part of what's appealing about them is that they require technical expertise to actually build, but then anyone can use them. You can say, you know, anyone anyone can click on an image and say, this is red. How important is the red in this other image? And it'll give you a score back. And that's that's useful even to someone without the technical understanding. Yeah, I mean, th this gets back to your, you know, saying that you wanted to sort of provide a, you know, curriculum in the book. And I, I was actually going to ask you, what would be the right curriculum, you know, to, for someone who, you know, to get a degree in AI ethics or a degree in the alignment problem? Because we're, you know, we're going to go on to talk about ethics broadly and, and human values and what that means. So there's that whole humanities side and philosophy side to it. And then there's the technical side and the math side. People don't like doing all of that. They kind of want to be one or the other. And maybe maybe that's what you're saying is that it, it's going to take a team anyway of various experts. But, you know, presumably there'll be some degrees popping up in AI ethics. So yeah. maybe, your, maybe your book will be the first textbook. Well, in some ways, you know, I would be very satisfied if that were the case. You know, that's that's part of what I was trying to do is to lay out a rough curriculum, you know, but but a, a curriculum in the medium of storytelling in, largely. Um, and it, it, I have, you know, begun to see certain universities actually using this for their, uh, you know, classes. Cool. And to me, that's immensely satisfying. Um, but I think we're going to see, oh, I bet. Yeah. we're going to see a lot more of that, more of that meaning just a lot more interest broadly at in higher education in trying to put some kind of curriculum together, um, whether that's for computer science majors specifically or for philosophy majors who want to come at the, mm -hmm. the material from the other side or, you know, people studying law. Um, there's the whole intersection between the law and some of these issues. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I really think, yeah, the team ideas, it's, it seems like it's always the right, more and more the right answer these days, uh, that you just need a broad diversity of people who are deeply, have deep expertise in a very certain thing, and then have enough shallow expertise to go cross-modal and talk with other experts. That's right. Seems like the answer. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, there there are, you know, specific case studies I could point to where having that kind of cross-disciplinary team ends up being really important. So, for example, some of the work that's being done on uh, debiasing word embedding models um, involves, you know, going to actual people and saying, which of these analogies strikes you as an, as an appropriate analogy versus a stereotype, you know, is man is to woman as mm -hmm. aunt is, or as uncle is to aunt. Is that okay? Or is, you know, um, linebacker is to nurse is that not okay you know like um it actually requires some methodology for extracting that information from people and you have to think very carefully about what population of people you're sampling what is the exact wording of the hmm. question you know so there was one team from microsoft research and you know when you ask people is this problematic you get a different answer than if you ask people is it a stereotype versus is this prejudicial. You know, there are these subtle linguistic differences yeah. that then manifest and you get a different response to your um, question and you, then you, the model trains slightly differently. So, having a little bit of that social... You're keying science. into their sort of biases and their own judgments. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, and it's really helpful to actually work with social science people who have experience asking these, you know, wording these questions and, and knowing how the wording affects the response you get and things like that. So, so in, in consciousness, in the consciousness literature, and I suppose in the philosophy of consciousness, there's this famous distinction between the easy and the hard problem, right? Where the easy problem is figuring out the neural activity that may be related or underlies consciousness. Uh, and the hard problem is, is yoking uh, that activity to our subjective experience or coming up with an explanation, uh, explanation of what it feels like to be a bat or a human or, or someone and uh, another thing I thought about reading your book is that, you know, whether to think of this in terms of an easy and hard problem uh, for the value alignment uh, problem as well, the easy problem would be building the, the algorithms uh, that function the way that we want them to function. But the hard problem is knowing what to build. In other words, knowing our own values. 
And that seems to be at the crux of uh, uh, perhaps an obstacle in moving forward, or at least a challenge. Um, one of the quotes you use in the book is from Roman uh, Yampolsky. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, mm -hmm. uh, but he he says, we as humanity do not agree on common values and even parts we do agree on change with time. And this is a, you know, this is, a, so this is like a fundamental issue. And I had Chris Summerfield and Sam Gershman on a couple episodes ago and, you know, they talked about it. There's an anecdote. Um, I like this anecdote about Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, that I read in a comments section, I think on YouTube. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I never read comments on YouTube. But anyway, um, Stevie Ray Vaughan gave this advice to a kid um, learning guitar, and the kid had only realized much, much later who was giving him advice. Mm. But um, Stevie Ray Vaughan said to him, who of course, is, Stevie Ray Vaughan's a famous blues guitarist. He said, make sure that when you practice, slow down and play accurately. Speed will come later. Otherwise, you'll just be practicing your mistakes. And I wonder if that, I mean, this is... <laughs> Well, all of that is to lead up to this question, I suppose. So, you know, how do we deal with this paradox that we define the values and problems for AI, we as humans do, uh, whereas we get our values, um, they're s somehow defined by the environment and our need to survive. So um, I, I, maybe I'll just let you comment on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's there's so many different things there to, to kind of jump off on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess maybe working slightly uh, in reverse order, so starting with what you were saying at the end about evolution, there is this really fascinating connection between AI alignment and evolution in exactly the way that you've described, which is that um, there's some fitness function that comes from the environment that has to do with how people actually survive, reproduce, etc. But the drives that we have instilled into us by evolution have sort of a funny non-obvious relationship to that fitness um you know the actual mm. things that people think about and care about on a day-to-day -day basis are you know like having that second cup of coffee or am i going to get that promotion or you know, whatever it might be you know all these all these things that preoccupy us and there's kind of, yeah, this two, two stage optimization, which is, you know, what, what are the right drives to give people such that their attempts to optimize those goals will produce this behavior that fits the, the higher level fitness function that comes from the environment. Um, so mm -hmm. this is something that computer scientists like Andrew Bartow at UMass Amherst and Satinder Singh at University of Michigan, there's a lot of, interest in thinking about this from a reinforcement learning perspective of if we want to see a certain behavior from a reinforcement learning agent, we are now putting ourselves in the shoes of evolution, so to speak. What drive do we give that agent? What, you know, utility function, reward function do we give that agent such that as it starts learning in that environment uh, to maximize that particular reward function, we end up seeing the behavior that we want to see. And the obvious answer, which is not necessarily correct, but the obvious answer is just give the agent the goal, which is the thing that you really actually want. And if the agent were kind of infinitely resourceful, infinitely intelligent, had infinitely much time to optimize, then you really would want it to, uh, you really would want it to have the quote unquote real reward function. But if it's bounded in some way, either computationally bounded or bounded in lifetime or whatever it might be, then you might have to give it something else, either that's kind of more learnable or whatever the case might be. And there's a totally non-obvious, non-linear relationship between those things. Um, so that's been a very fertile area where, you know, things like evolutionary psychology and reinforcement learning are in dialogue. And I think it also really connects deeply with this question of AI safety and, you know, what what are the reward functions that we want our intelligent agents to pursue and how do those reward functions relate to the actual behavior we want to see? You know, so this is an area which 
connects, you know, not just to the evolutionary stuff, but also to, you know, management science and economics. Like, what are the ideal incentive structures to create in a company yeah. to get the kind of uh, behavior you want from your subordinates? Or how do you incentivize the other party in a contract to do things that you want to do? And I mean, etymologically, that that was the original alignment problem. Like, that's the computer science community is borrowing the term alignment from the economists who have been talking about, you know, aligning values within an organization or aligning incentives between two parties. So, it's kind of, it's a reminder that the alignment problem was a, it was always a human problem first um, and probably always, always will be. <laughs> Forever will be. Yeah. For, uh, yeah. For better or worse. Um, you know, if we, and I think this is an important point, like if, even if we are able to at some point in the coming century declare victory in the, you know, the technical value alignment problem between the creator of a machine learning system and the behavior of the system or the goals of the system, um, you're still left with, it's, it's kind of turtles all the way down because, you know, the engineer that builds that system, they have incentives which are, you know, might differ in certain ways from what their manager wants or for what th that person's executives want or the shareholders want. There are users that use the system that have their own, you know, stake in it. And so, the technical part of alignment is just one link in the chain, so to speak. Um, I think it's a critical link, but, you know, this, this sort of ramifies all the way through society and, uh, <laughs> you know, we've been trying to develop good systems of incentives and good governance, you know, for thousands of years. So, I'm a little bit... That's what laws are. Yeah, yeah, that's that's well said, yeah. Um, and, you know, that's what political philosophy and political science have been working on. And um, so, I'm more, you know, in the short term anyway, I'm more optimistic about the the actual technical part, but I think it's a nice reminder that this uh, this is a problem that goes just beyond the machine learning dimension. I, mean, I, I have trouble deciding any given night, like what to have to din for dinner, right? And what to make my children. I can't even, I, I'm, I feel so frequently out of touch with my own values. I wonder how important it is to, to know thyself, to solve my own problems, you know, and, and what I value uh, before asking it, either programming my values, my quote unquote values into an AI robot, or even asking it to, and, and we'll come on to this later, or asking it to learn my own values. I mean, and how important do you think it is for us to solve this issue that we don't, there's, there seems to be a fundamental lack of understanding of our own values. Even, you know, our actions speak differently than our words. I don't know, 80% of the time. Sure. Do as I say, not as I do, that sort of thing. I mean, is that a, is that a fundamental obstacle? Um, I think it is. Uh, to just for the sake of uh, you know the conversation, I'll I'll also include the devil's advocate position, though, um, which is, you know, the the devil's advocate position would be something like, we shouldn't be that worried about whether systems can solve things that we don't know what the right answer is, because for you know it's not not any different from the status quo you know so people say this for uh, for example about the trolley problem that like why should we be worried about ai solving the trolley problem if the entire point of the the reason the trolley problem exists and is so discussed is that people's in, uh, ethical intuitions diverge so that's the arguably the least important thing for us to care about in terms of ma the machine behavior is the place where we don't agree like, surely we should make sure that the machine does what we want in the 99% of the time that we can all agree on what is the right thing to do. Let's start there. Mm -hmm. And then we can worry about all these corner cases where we don't even agree with each other. I think there's something to be said about that. On the other hand, I, you know, I broadly agree with you. I, I think there's, there's a Norbert Wiener quote here that sticks with me. He says, um, you know, there are many times in human history where the only thing shielding us from the full impact of our folly was our own impotence. So, if we... Nice. And, and I mean, there are machine learning analogies, I think, maybe buried within that of, you know, things like overfitting. We have techniques in machine learning to combat overfitting, which include early stopping, you know, so just don't 
don't apply as much optimization pressure. That's a form of regularization. Um, mm-hmm. m- more broadly, you know, I think there are many, many cases either societally or in, in one's individual life where you say like, well, thank goodness I didn't have the power to get exactly what I wanted because I now realize I wanted the right, the <laughs> yeah. wrong thing, right? <laughs> um, and so, I do think there's a real danger of amplifying our ability to get what we want in such a way that, um, you know, we short circuit this process of feedback or of learning that happens or we make you know, we make mistakes uh, harder to recover from, et cetera. And so, I, I think you're, you're, the way you phrased your question for me was really provocative because you said something like, um, you know, sh- shouldn't I really go through this process of introspection before I train this AI, you know, agent or whatever to infer my values and start taking actions on my behalf? And I think that's a very interesting way of putting it because... Um, in the world as it exists, you don't you don't have the choice to um, give the okay about when that model should start being built. Like YouTube has a model of what it thinks you want based on how you behave. Twitter has a model, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that's happening now. And I think there's a huge problem in thinking about some of these questions, both from an actual cognitive science perspective of you know, or behavioral economics perspective of there's some mapping from human behavior to human desire slash values. We don't really know what it is. As you say, our actions and our words often diverge. There was some study that crossed my timeline at at some point, which I'm not going to be able to cite, but it was basically <laughs> just adding like one second of latency into a dialogue box about resharing an article, you know, altered people's behavior. Right. Things like this, right? Um, so that, you know, if you take the kind of Kahneman thinking fast and slow approach, you know, then we have this heterogeneous set of desires, the fast set of the fast agent and the slow agent are kind of j- jostling around in our head. And, uh, you know, a system that's doing inverse reinforcement learning or whatever, looking at us, um, is going to infer different things based on which whether system one or system two is in charge in that given moment. There's a lot of unsolved problems here. I mean, there's there's a very interesting interdisciplinary conversation happening between computer science and cognitive science around, you know, what's the right formal model to use for um, human sure. irrationality. So, there's, the, you know, a, a very widely used model in a lot of systems called Boltzmann noise or Bo- Boltzmann irrationality, which says, you know, humans do take action A in a given situation with the probability proportional to the exponentiated reward. Um, so, it includes a little bit of noisiness there. And mm-hmm. that has become this widely used model for, yeah, sometimes people don't do the right thing, but they do the right thing more of the time and relative to how much better the right thing is than the next best thing, whatever. Um, It's a pretty simple model. It works in practice, but I think there's like a giant, you know, caution sign of like, this is just a completely provisional, like we, this is an empty socket (laughs) into which we need to plug in like a much more, uh, you know, fully articulated sense of like how the brain actually works. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned that providing one second as a buffer, right? And that how how much of a difference that makes. I mean, just as another, a a more chronologically longer time span example. I mean, there's sage advice in the world of academia, and this applies to any world where you're getting feedback, authorship as well where whenever you're getting feedback on your manuscript, on your paper, on your on your book chapter or whatever, uh, l- read the feedback uh, immediately when you get it and then immediately put it into a drawer and lock the drawer and set a timer for like two days. And mm-hmm. you can't look at it again until that timer goes off because you need that two days for it to process, to decompress, to not send a pipe bomb through the mail, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. uh, and so there are these practices that, you know, the, the are better our better angels would always Mm. implement, but I don't know that a a robot would, for instance. Yeah. And I think there's, um, 
you know, there's a lot of work to be done, both in the theoretical side of how do we extract from someone's, you know, fast behavior, slow behavior, you know, verbal, you know, yeah. instruction, you know, they're, you know, one month later, what's their reflective, um, you know, equilibrium of what they would have wanted to have done. How do we synthesize that and integrate that into this kind of total picture of what the person's quote unquote real values are, right? I think that's, there's a lot of really yeah. interesting work to be done there, but there's also the like the practical, you know, applied business ethics of while the you know while the theoretical community goes off and tries to work all that stuff out, you know, at a practical level, what are these systems optimizing for? Mm -hmm. Do we need some kind of regulatory requirement that says like, no, you must, uh, you must you have some kind of uh, social obligation or some kind of fiduciary responsibility to optimize for people's reflective equilibrium, not their, you know, fast twitch, uh, you know, system one or whatever. Or will will the market decide, you know, which, which of those companies succeed or not? So, I, there's like this long-term intellectual project, but there's also kind of like, there are systems out there making these inferences as we speak and um you know we had hope we had better hope that we don't go too far down the wrong path in the meanwhile while we're working all that all you know the real answer out yeah well, i was gonna one of my questions to you was going to be and is what what these sort of automated systems you know have taught us thus far about ourselves i mean you know there's <laughs> just like the evils of social media and appealing to our base stereotype stereotypes and and instincts and that quote unquote value judgments mm. and are you know how easy it is to manipulate us i'm including myself we're all idiots you know when it comes oh, to yeah. being super easy to manipulate and and having really tough biases to overcome and I, you know are there examples uh, that you know and and you would you talk about in the book also about you know the, the penal code essentially and and um using automated systems to uh help judges declare whether someone should be put up uh for what is it called when you when they should be uh removed from jail and under probation it is called when you're up for parole parole yes whether people should be paroled thank you uh mm -hmm. my my vocabulary is escaping <laughs> me and you know that makes me that made me think like and i mentioned earlier like aren't laws supposed to reflect our values and haven't we learned about our values through the breaking of those laws and the adherence to those laws and jail time and recidivism and all that shouldn't that have been teaching us about our values all along and i don't know that it has mm. and maybe you have an opinion on this uh and then, so then that leads into the, like this question of whether you know autom automated facebook feed um d displays you know have that has that taught us anything you know, about our values, or are we just completely blind to them? You know, I mean, what do you think? Are there examples where we've actually learned something about ourselves through these sorts of follies? That's a great question. I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that I take away from the history of the law is thank God it's an iterative ongoing process. Um, <laughs> you know, because we, yeah. Every society looks back on the society of a century prior and thinks of them as kind of moral barbarians. And there's no reason to think that <laughs> yeah. we've reached the end of that process. Um, and so, this is, I think, something that's very critical in thinking about present-day AI systems as well as kind of the future AGI, the sort of long-term vision, is just leaving the door open for the ability to iterate. So... One example that's, you know, more sort of a straight up machine learning example. Well, I'll give you two. One is there's a, a tech company that will remain nameless, but they uh, released a new version of their uh, app and they started to notice that their ad metrics were tanking and they were trying to figure out what was going on. And to make a long story short, the like version number of the app was being fed into the ad targeting system as a feature. And the model that was doing ad targeting essentially began to understand the concept of an early adopter. And it said, 
okay, these people that are on version 14 <laughs> have like strikingly, you know, specific preferences. They're into tech products. They maybe have more money or they whatever, whatever, <laughs> right? They're more um, open to trying new things, whatever it might They're be. more likely to have that version. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that demographic attribute of people running version 14 became less true with every hour that version 14 was out. Mm -hmm. And the ad targeting model was relearning, but it was always behind the curve. And so, for the entire duration of that rollout, it was always mistakenly thinking that future users would have the same kind of properties as the the existing install base. And um, I think that's a, a great cautionary tale. Uh, you know, there's another one of a group of computational linguists trying to reproduce a, um, a model that they'd read in a paper and they couldn't get the same accuracy of, of the paper. And they were trying to figure out, you know, was there a bug in their code? No. Was there some secret sauce that the original authors put into their paper that wasn't disclosed? No, it wasn't that. Turns out that it was just um, these models were being trained by scraping huge corpora off the web. And the the things people were talking about on the internet changed, you know, in the nine months or whatever since that paper was written. Oh, man. And the model just wasn't as accurate now because now you're training on uh, linguistic data that's kind of moved on. People are using different expressions, the content is different and so forth. So, there are a lot of cases like that where the accuracy of a model can erode on the scale of hours in the first case or days and or, you know, months to years in the second case. Um, the Princeton computer scientist Arvind Narayanan has made this point where he said, you know, we have this narrative that tech, tech moves too fast for people to catch up. But in some ways, it's the opposite. Like, think about how many Fortran and COBOL systems there are still in production doing finance <laughs> and things like this. Um, you know, imagine if some of the ML systems developed in 2015 were still in production in the 2040s, 2050s. Like, that would yeah. be terrifying. So, I think that's a really, that's a really important point. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I actually had to learn Fortran. That tells you how old I am. But, um, right before, I, I was actually in college when they stopped teaching Fortran and started teaching C++ uh, for the aerospace engineering program. So, I, that's a, well, that was a while ago. <laughs> well, so, okay. So, Brian, I want to, um, I'd like to go through like a couple specific examples, you know, in the book that, that you talk about. And uh, I have my own, you know, examples to ask you about, but I thought I'd just start by asking you, I'm curious what you were surprised about that you mm. learned about in in making the book or either, you know, that you didn't know about and were surprised about or, you know, something that really changed your thinking or really directed your thinking in a new way or something. Or, you know, because you use so many examples from the book, it's impossible to list them all. But yeah. So I thought I'd just ask you what, you know, what some of your favorites are, et cetera. Um, yeah, as, yeah, as you say I'm sort of feel spoiled for choice but so the one that comes to the top of my mind in terms of one that both surprised me and also gave me a sense of hopefulness let's say um there was a paper um a couple of years ago now from it was a collaboration between a group at OpenAI and a group at DeepMind um and the paper is called deep reinforcement learning from human preferences um, and the mm -hmm. idea to give a little bit of context, you know, there's been a lot of progress in particular since the turn of the millennium, the early 2000s in what's called inverse reinforcement learning, where rather than explicitly giving the system an objective function and saying, you know, optimize your behavior against this, uh, you sort of go the other direction and you say, I'm going to provide you with a bunch of behavior. And I want you to figure out what objective function I appear to be optimizing for. And then I want you to, after the mm -hmm. words go and uh, try to maximize that. Um, this has been instrumental in a lot of areas, you know, famously in the 2000s. It was uh, Peter Abiel and Andrew Ng at Stanford with their helicopter doing all these crazy helicopter stunts. And I think particularly significant was it could do stunts that were too difficult for human radio-controlled helicopter pilots to do. Mm -hmm. Merely by attempting the stunt, 
the inverse reinforcement learning system could see, okay, I, I understand what you're trying and failing to do. I'm just going to go do that because I have, you know, I can optimize the controls on this thing, you know, better than any human actually could fly it. So there were a lot of signature successes in inverse reinforcement learning, but they had this requirement that you had to actually provide the demonstration yourself. Right. And right. so part of the part of what was going on with this paper, um, Deep Reinforcement Learning from Human Preferences, they were saying this demonstration thing is kind of a bottleneck. Um, let's think about situations where um, we don't want to require the human to actually demonstrate the behavior. We just want them to be able to recognize it. So the example that they came up with was um, having a, a virtual robot performing backflips in this environment called Mujoko, which some people might recognize. So the idea was um, it's really hard for a human to do a backflip. Obviously, some can, but most can't. <laughs> um, and it also wouldn't be clear how that would generalize to a, you know, a body with different morphology. Um, it's hard to even get a virtual robot to do a backflip with a, you know, game controller. It's really hard to define a an explicit reward function that models a backflip if you have to put in coefficients for the rotational, you know, momentum and the torques on the joints and all these things. But if you saw the robot doing one, you would recognize it. And so what they did was they had um, the robot initially starts just writhing around randomly and they present the user with pairs of video clips. And they say, which of these video clips looks, you know, epsilon more like a backflip? And say, okay, well, this one is like somewhat writhing to the right. So that's, uh, that's sort of closer than the other one. And there would be this kind of inverse reinforcement learning process in the background saying, okay, we're being fed a series of these, you know, head-to-head -head, uh, preferential judgments. You know, the user liked the left clip in this case, but the right clip in this other case. Mm -hmm. We're going to build a model of what we think you think a backflip is. And then we're going to provisionally start optimizing our behavior for that and then show you another pair of video clips. And you can, again, tell us which one you think was closer to the mark. And it turns out, I mean, this there was nothing intuitively obvious to me or to the researchers themselves that this was going to work. But after about mm. 900 comparisons, which takes about an hour, it's somewhat tedious, but it's only one hour, uh, the robot is doing these gymnastically beautiful backflips. It's sort of tucking tucking the leg in order to spin faster the way that, you know, a figure skater pulls their arms in. Um, it's sticking the landing. I mean, it's it's it, there's something actually beautiful about it. And the I guess the reason why that example sticks with me is, A, I mean, it's just this very, very visible success story of something that was not obvious it was going to work. Um, the amount of feedback is fairly minimal 900 bits is not a lot of information mm -hmm. and you know the the instructions that the mechanical turk workers were given um was select the video clip in which better things happen that it was that vague um and that to me holds the promise that you know obviously we have a lot of a lot of technical work to be done uh to actually scale this up but um, the idea of just indicate which which world has better things happening um, suggests at least that you could generalize this, you know, all the way to thinking about the kinds of societies that we want. Yeah, that's interesting that that overlaps with um, an idea called open endedness, at least in my head. I had Ken Stanley on who, who mm. uh, talks about uh, open endedness and yeah. uh, training agents in this way and the way that he frames it is not necessarily, um, so you train the robot or agent, not necessarily giving it feedback about what seems better, but what seems more interesting, which is a subtle yeah. difference, right? Because what seems better kind of entails a goal and a value, which which then uh, iterates and, and the robot ends up doing the backflip. And I'm, you know, I don't know that what seems interesting would get you there, but they're at least kind of similar in, in uh, spirit. Yeah. His work is very interesting to me, um, and there's a lot of great connections between um, research like his and the sort of um, 
cognitive science of infant play and you know how do infants play with toys and which toys they play with yeah, and so forth. I wanna, that kind of yeah, I want to talk about that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, a big part of the complexity of interestingness is that um, the I think about these things coming from a computer science perspective of like what's the method signature and um, interestingness seems to require um, us to provide the existing set of behaviors as part of the method signature. Like something is interesting right. relative to the other stuff that the agent is doing versus yeah. something is good, you know, yes or no. Um, so it is more complex. And I think you know, part of what Stanley and, and his collaborator, Joel Lehman, um, yeah, part of their work is really interesting in terms of like developing a portfolio of behaviors that are distinct relative to the other behaviors in the portfolio so that there is sort of like a kind of a contingency there or complexity there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, a little bit more about inverse reinforcement learning before moving on to a couple other examples, because uh, I mean, this is, uh, w that surprised me too, reading the book that I, I didn't real realize that the concept of inverse reinforcement learning was as old as it is. I mean, it's not mm. old per se, but it's been a couple decades now since it was originally uh, formulated, I suppose. And and this gets to um, like Stuart Russell's ideas about you know the way to fix AI and to make make value al aligned AI is is through a process like inverse reinforcement learning where it's the agent's goal to infer what your your reward function and and then interact with you either cooperatively or based on inferring based on your behaviors uh, what what you must be inferring. So so anyway, that's that. It, I I didn't I hadn't realized that it had been around and been worked on for so long because these days you you just hear about deep minds and open AIs, reinforcement learning algorithms, uh, you know, killing it in in all sorts of games. Um, and I don't I don't know that they're using any re inver or that any inverse reinforcement learning is even necessary in those in those tasks in games. Uh -um. Yeah, no. I mean, that's part of what makes games such an attractive domain is that there is this ready uh, reward function that you can just kind of plug in. Although there have been some some very interesting uh, cautionary tales where, for example, OpenAI was training an agent to do these um, racing games, uh, in particular, this boat racing game called Coast Runners, and they were optimizing for in-game score because it's very hard to parameterize like winning the race because the you know the agent would need a representation of the track what is a lap what is, you know which are the other agents how do i know if i'm in front or behind or whatever um but you can always just tell it you have 4500 points this action gave you 100 more points great but it turns out that maximizing score diverges in certain scenarios from actually winning the race. And so you end up just doing these circles around this power up area forever while all the other, you know, players pass you by. So that's kind of a an alignment problem in its own right. But yeah, I mean to your point about the history of inverse reinforcement learning, um you know, it's very interesting because uh you know the idea goes back to uh Stuart Russell in the late 90s, uh I think early 2000s, late 90s. I think 98 is what you cite maybe. 98, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, walking to the grocery store downhill and thinking about um, how organisms optimize their gait, but optimize it for what? Do they optimize it for caloric expenditure? Do they optimize it for stress on the joints? Um, so this is, you know, these are the kinds of thoughts that someone like Stuart Russell has on his way to Safeway. It's like, oh, what is the objective function of the human gait? Oh, that's interesting. Um, if we knew it, then we could uh, essentially put motion capture uh, the, the motion capture industry out of business because we would know what a realistic right. gate would be under all these circumstances. But here it is, it's, you know, the year 2021 and there's still a motion capture industry. So it indicates something about the complexity of the constraints that uh, actual organisms face, uh, that we yeah. still don't really know the objective function of an animal gate, um, which is a sober, a sober note for the prospect of like, uh, inferring all of human values um, suggests yeah. that we have a ways to go. Isn't it an easy answer just to look cool? Isn't that why people try to look cool when they walk <laughs> to attract mates? That's why I look so cool when I walk down right. the hill. Yeah. Right. So yes, the the same open AI DeepMind team that did the backflips could uh, could have an agent that walks in a cool way, 
right? Yes. We could discern what is your what's your platonic form of cool walk? Uh, we could objectively extract that. cool. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Two things. One, I, do you do you feel like we're just at the you know very beginning? Uh, you know, how far do we have? Just in a very broad speculative guess, how how far until these things are solved? <sighs> um, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll come. Well, I'll let you, I'll let that stew. We'll come back to it at the end. I'll, I'll ask it again. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you just quickly before we move on uh, about you know the most human human book because you just mentioned yeah. GPT three and all of the interesting language models that have come and now your book is like a dinosaur. I'm just kidding. It's huh. actually yeah. It's still um, really valuable and I only read it fairly recently within the last year and and really enjoyed it for many of the same reasons. Um, but it really you know it's interesting because it takes you all the way through t- you know to where you were. You know, from the history of language, you know, learning and the Turing test and, and you know, to when you're winning awards, pretending to be the best human, for instance. Uh, and I'm just curious how you reflect now on that book, thinking about all that's happened since then. And, yeah, you know, your, your kind of overall thought thought about that. That's a great question. Right. So <laughs> the most human human describes a set of events that took place in late 2009 and the book okay, itself. Yeah was published in early 2011. Um, and yeah, to put that into perspective, I mean, to your, yeah, it feels Jurassic because the spring of t- 2011 was six months before Siri, um, you know, became a thing in the iPhone 4S, uh, t- let alone, you know, <laughs> Alexa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, let alone, right, giant transformer networks that we have now. Yeah. Um, so, in some ways, I think the book... I, in in a way had the misfortune of being too far ahead of its time in terms of these questions of what what is the end game of the Turing test, right? What does it mean to inhabit um, an online world or a digital world where we really don't know who or what we're dealing with? I think that was starting to become a question in, you know, the early 2010s, but is now I think we're really bracing ourselves that I, for one, am very curious and uncertain how online discourse withstands the impact of something like, you know, GPT-like models that Mm -hmm. can produce reasonable human statements with some kind of valence, with some kind of agenda at, you know, context-specific statements that push a particular you know, attitude or worldview or propositional content at scale. I don't, I don't know what that's going to do to, um, you know, civic discourse. Like how, how does Twitter, how does Reddit survive that? I think that's going to be a really interesting question. What are you pessimistic, pessimistic or optimistic or just neutral? <sighs> don't want to, you don't have to, you don't have I to feel, commit. I feel, I feel short term pessimistic. Um, I mean, it may be, <laughs> it may be that um, I, I really don't know, to be honest with you. You know, I don't know if we're going to require some kind of cryptographic solution where, you know, we need public figures PGP key or something like this in order mm-hmm. to determine that this tweet really was written by them or what, I don't know, something like there's the kind of purely technical solution. Um, there's a world in which everyone just feels super skeptical of online discourse and we really only trust people face to face. And so then the world starts to look like it looked, you know, in the 19th century or something. Mm. I don't really know. It feels, it it feels very uncertain to me. Um, I feel the same way. Yeah. 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 It's, there are so many reasons to feel um, sad that Turing wasn't, didn't live longer because I think we could really, use the voice and perspective of someone like that now you know the the turing test has gone from this thought experiment to being you know at at the point where i wrote the most human human it had become this hassle of online life that you know you get these spam texts you know or spam email from your partner saying hey click this link i need your social security number or something and you're like that's not how my partner talks right, so that's not right. how they write or whatever um and you know by the late 2010s this was a matter of kind of existential threat to democracy of you know 
foreign governments influencing, you know, political speech at scale. So I I suspect that Turing would have been stunned at the mm. stakes, uh, how high the stakes would be for for thinking about some of these questions. Yeah, and I, I I'm honestly as curious as anyone, you know, what what comes next. Um, Norbert Wiener would not be stunned. I guess this is the kind of thing he forewarned about. But yes, yeah. yes. But let's talk about. Um, but I, I know we're kind of running out of time here, and there's just so many different examples. And I encourage people to just get the book and and read it because there are so many different facets to think about. Um, one of the ones that you mentioned a few minutes ago is that you that you think has a lot of promise is you know the the study of um, you know, the cognitive science of children and infants and what they know and and how they learn and how they go about developing. I recently had Alison Gopnik uh, on the show, so oh, yeah. we, we talked uh, a lot about her work, you know, on exploration and a little bit about um, how children build, you know, these abstract causal generative models of the world, um, and a little bit about uh, how they learn through imitation. And you know, you talk about all this stuff also in the book. So I think it's in the section on unknown unknowns is uh, when you start start uh, or at least um, go into a little bit of depth you know, about the, the cognitive science of infants. And maybe I can just let you, I'll, I'll just give that to you to set up like what are unknown unknowns, the famous <laughs> Donald Rumsfeld uh, uh, phrase. And and then, you know, what does uh, the cognitive science of children have to do with with helping that along? Yeah, well, there's, an, uh, there's a number of places in the book where, I mean, even Allison's research specifically comes yeah. up. So, if yeah. I take this in a direction that's different than what you have in mind, then um, feel free to redirect me. But okay. w- I think one of the places where um, developmental psychology comes in very explicitly into machine learning is this idea of learning from sparse rewards. Um, so, you're, you know, there are certain Atari games, for example, Montezuma's Revenge is one that are famously impossible for traditional RL algorithms to master because the environment just doesn't give you very much feedback. Um, you have to do this huge string of tasks before you're presented with the very first uh, 100 points in the game, for example. And so, how does any traditional um, RL algorithm that's using, uh, you know, epsilon greedy exploration or just kind of random random button mashing, how are you ever going to string together the correct sequence of actions to get the very first reward and even know that you're on the right track? So, this has been uh, an outstanding challenge in machine learning. And... Uh, computer scientists, people like Mark Bellamar um, at uh, Google Brain and, and um, Mila in Montreal, people like Deepak Pathak at um, Carnegie Mellon, um, people at UC Berkeley are turning to these ideas that are coming out of cognitive science of formal models for um, kind of self-directed play from infants. And people mm-hmm. like Alison Gopnik uh, at Berkeley, people like Laura Schultz at MIT. Um, have done a lot of really interesting work showing that, you know, children are very motivated by novelty. So, if they see something they've never seen before, that there's something intrinsically rewarding or intrinsically motivating about that. Um, if they take an action whose outcome is surprising, there's something kind of delightful and motivating about that. And the computer science community, the machine learning community has kind of imported some of these ideas wholesale and said, okay, let's let's have this agent in a video game environment. And, you know, to, to up the ante a little bit, we'll just unplug the actual in-game score altogether and just have this agent take actions with the reward function being, you know, if I see something on screen that's kind of weird or unusual, that's cool. Let me treat that as rewarding. If I do something and I don't anticipate what the outcome will be, um, let's treat that as rewarding and we want to do more of those things. And it turns out in many cases that what you get looks an awful lot like human play. And and mm-hmm. in fact, um, even just measured by pure in-game progress, these methods are able to succeed in environments where kind of traditional uh, epsilon greedy exploration mm-hmm. cannot. And so, I mean, to me, that's, that is um, one of the coolest areas of the field because we are now confronting problems that are so rec- kind of humanly recognizable that the best place to turn for insights is de- developmental cognitive science. Um, and when you plug their formal models for exploration and play mm-hmm. into these, you know, deep Q networks or whatever, these RL agents, you 
you're suddenly able to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, and then that in turn gives this kind of formal model of behavior that can go back over to the psychology and cognitive science community and offer them some new ideas. So, I mean, to me, that that's one of the really exciting things about the progress of AI is that we really are starting to see, you know, as, as these agents become more human-like, you know, in, in certain ways, there is an opportunity for that dialogue to happen on both sides, right? We, yeah. we take what we know about humans and make actual progress in ML and vice versa. We can um, take these formal models from ML and learn something about ourselves and what motivates us and how we learn. To me, that I think that's thrilling. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, you mentioned uh, Laura Schultz and one of the things, uh, she's sort of taken it a step further, I suppose, and proposed that... Um, you know, she's observed, you know, and, and we all know that that children will invent their own problems to solve. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that that's like extreme exploration. Right. To And they'll invent their own rewards, fake rewards and and incur their own fake costs. Right. Punishments within mm. this made up uh, world where they, they invent the, the problem that they're trying to solve. And and um, Laura and her colleagues see this as a potential way that children explore the what what they don't know they don't know by solving these made up problems uh, they're actually inventing ways that they will later use to th- these sort of novel solutions as you know something to fall back on when they're when they become adults or when they're growing up and they need novel solutions to problems that they don't uh, that they don't understand so they're actually mm. generating unknown solutions to unknown unknowns almost by creating these worlds. It's pretty fascinating. And and that goes into the exploration in machine learning literature as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there are people like um, Jürgen Schmidhuber has uh, this idea that he calls power play, where, you know, these agents are essentially, you know, finding their own objectives that are yeah. interesting in the environment. And Ken Stanley also, I mean, he's done some work on, you know, developing this set of, you know, this kind of portfolio of behaviors that have some interestingness or some kind of diversity uh, relevant uh, with respect to one another. Then when you put that, you kind of pre-train the agent on, you know, just developing a diverse portfolio of behaviors. Then you put them in a novel environment with a particular task and, you know, they can draw on one of those things in order to solve that task more efficiently. Yeah. Um, so I think that all kind of points back to a similar story. It's ex- um, exciting times, I think. I completely agree. So, I mean, we didn't, we just scratched the surface. I mean, there's there's a ton of other stuff to get to in the book, obviously, like I said. Um, I want to wrap up with maybe just a broad, So, I mean, so I'll, I'll quote you from the book here. Mm. So, we are, we are in danger. So, um, we've talked a little about robots and agents, and we haven't really talked so much about what you in this quote I'm about to read um, see as as maybe even more critical quote we are in danger of losing control of the world not to ai or to machines as such but to models to formal often numerical specifications for what exists and for what we want so i'll just ask you to uh, unpack that um, and then just a, a question on on top of that you know in in all your hundreds of interviews and conversations how would you summarize the overall feeling that people have with regard to how much they worry about these sort of issues that we've been talking about. Yeah. So, I mean, this quote, you know, the idea of models, right? The the book opens with uh, three epigraphs that are about models. Um, you know, Peter Norvig recounting a conversation with someone who was on at NASA working on a Mars landing. And they said, you know, our job was not to land on Mars. It was to land on the formal model of Mars that we'd been right. given by uh, this other team. We have Rod Brooks saying, you know, the world is its own best model. And then the statistician George Box reminding us all models are wrong. And I think that's those epigraphs kind of hang over the whole book um, because it's important to think about the the modeling assumptions that get made in any domain. And, you know, the other the other epigraph that really rings through for me on this theme is um Hannah Arendt saying that, you know, the trouble with behaviorism is not that it's false, but that it could become true. Yeah. Yeah. And good. so, you know, to, to ground this in a real example of what am I talking about? I mean, there are a lot of cases where 
we make certain modeling assumptions and the, the world itself actually comes to conform to those modeling assumptions. You know, there are certain examples like there's a book called uh, An Engine, Not a Camera that's about financial models and showing how things like, if I'm remembering this correctly, like the Black Shoals was meant to predict option pricing, but then it became the kind of standard uh-huh. way for pricing options, uh-huh. um, things like that. In there's a, there the, in the quote of mine that you read, there's a bit of a sinister cast. And, and to help explain what I mean by that, I think about, for example, the self-driving Uber in Tempe, Arizona in 2018 that killed uh, the pedestrian Elaine Hertzberg as she was crossing the street. I read the National Transportation Safety Board, you know, analysis of that accident. And there were a couple of things. I mean, there were many, many intersecting factors. We could probably talk for, you know, 30 minutes or more about that one accident. But one of the things that was contributing to it was that um, the model did not anticipate jaywalking. Um, yeah. That yeah. The examples of pedestrians that existed in its training set were at, you know, marked zebra striped crosswalks. They were at intersections. They were at stop signs. And so, the idea that someone could be found in the middle of a street just crossing the street was kind of not in the world view. It was not in this, you know, paradigm of the car. Um, And the other thing that was going on with the car was that, you know, like most computer vision systems, it was trained using these labeled examples that had specific categories. So, something was either a cyclist or a pedestrian or a vehicle or, a, you know, an inanimate object. Um, you know, never, never both or, you know, th- this idea that th- this set of categories is both mutually exclusive and exhaustive. That That is kind of a, f- almost a metaphysical or ontological assumption. And falsity. Kind of implicitly and false, right. And it's sort of implicitly bl- baked into uh, most computer vision systems. And in this case... Um, this woman was walking a bicycle across the street. Mm. And so mm. the model said, okay, I see the, I see the frame of the bike. I see the tires, see the handlebars. That's a cyclist. No, there's no rider on top of it. The woman's feet are on the ground. She must be a pedestrian. Um, and it was kind of flickering between these two categories, you know, like tens of times per second. Mm. And due to a set of other bugs in the code, every time it changed the category, it would recompute the trajectory. So it was constantly losing its prediction of where she was going to be, you know, in the future. But this idea of modeling assumptions that are false, but they can become true, you know, there's a certain, there's a certain sinister way of thinking about a model like this, which is that, um, you know, in a, in a world where jaywalkers get killed, the assumption that jaywalkers don't exist becomes true. Be- you know, it, it becomes true over time. Um, in a world where you're either a yeah. pedestrian or a cyclist or you get killed, then, you know, the, again, these, these false assumptions, the world comes to resemble the simplified model. You're going to stop jaywalking. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of thing we really have to be on guard for. And there are computer scientists working on it. You know, there are, there's something called the open category problem that Tom Dietrich at Oregon, his collaborators working on. There are sort of calibrated Bayesian uncertainties. People like Yaron Gall, Zubin Garmani are working on, you know, there's, there's some theoretical work here, but I think there's this underlying point, which is that, you know, we really, we don't want to, mistake the map for the territory. And that mm-hmm. that is broadly speaking, I think one of the dangers of m- machine learning in general is that uh, you make certain modeling assumptions going in, and but then once that model enters into the environment, it could enforce the limits of its own understanding on that environment. That's the whole reinforcement learning challenge is that by acting in the world, you change the world. And exactly right. So your actions are dependent on your the, the, your your objective function, your reward function is dependent on your own actions. And so there's this That's right. cyclic thing. Yeah. So there are computer scientists like um, Scott Garbrandt at Machine Intelligence Research Institute working on this model um, that they call embedded agency, which is how does mm-hmm. an RL agent countenance the fact that it itself is part of the environment that it's trying to model, um, which will become 
the you know the more powerful these models get the more impactful their behavior the more important it will be that they have some notion of themselves as being in that environment so i yeah there's a lot of theoretical work but i think you know i think this is something we can't lose sight of and you know the the quote i keep coming back to is from hamlet of all places um which is uh you know there are, there are more things in heaven and earth horatio than are dreamt of in your philosophy um, baking nice. something like that into our models, I think, is is an important step. Yeah. Lastly here, um, well, two things. Uh, just to go back to the question I, I asked before, you know, through all your interviews and interactions with people, do you have a, a sense of how worried people are about these issues? I mean, it's to the, it's come to the fore now, but do, do people see, you know, are people pessimistic, optimistic? How big a deal do, you know, do you feel is in the zeitgeist? Um. Opinions differ. Um, so you get a little bit of everything, you know, as you might imagine. Um, I would say broadly, there are people who think, you know, uh, we're never, we're just not going to get to human level AI, you know, anytime soon. Uh, this century, for example, it's just not going to happen. And therefore, this is a bunch of mm. uh, misplaced worry. Um, there are people in what I would deem the slow takeoff camp that are saying, oh, no, we're certainly getting there, but it's going to be a kind of a boil the frog thing. If the universe will just start feeling weirder and weirder and gradually we'll realize like, oh, yeah, AGI is a thing. Um, mm. It's kind of crept up on us. There's the hard takeoff people who think that it, the transition will happen abruptly enough to essentially blindside society and suddenly we'll find ourselves in just an radically altered world. So I would personally identify with the slow takeoff group. I think I haven't heard a single convincing argument for why something like AGI can't or won't happen. Uh, I mean, I'm open, I'm open to such arguments existing, but I haven't yeah. heard any. Um, but I don't particularly find the hard takeoff scenario plausible that being said the um the actual impact of such a thing happening would be so great that it would, yeah. it'd be irresponsible not to have like at least 50 people thinking about it which is about <laughs> how many people are thinking about it right now i don't think that's too many yeah right right that's due to nick bostrom's book alone probably yeah yeah, I mean, yeah, and you know, groups like Miri have been thinking about this for a long time. Nick himself has, and I'm glad they are. Um, you know, I don't see those out outcomes as the most likely, but we could probably spare a few more brains uh, on that problem, just given its kind of expected value if it if it does happen. But my my personal view, I mean, I think there has been an interesting breaking of taboo, where even the phrase AGI was very rare in my social circles until about 2014, 2015. And now you see it in used in a pretty nonchalant way by companies like OpenAI and DeepMind. Um, you know, if you just look at their job listings page, they're like, we're trying to build AGI. We're, we're well on our way, you know, yeah. join, join the effort. And it's... Um, it's just part of how these companies, you know, identify. So, yeah, I mean, I think the the prospect of something like a kind of a general human level intelligence, I think is becoming a little bit more a part of people's implicit or explicit projection for what the rest of the century is going to look like. Um, certainly I get a little bit of that spooky, um, feeling when I interact with GPT-3 mm. and there's this question that has come up at some of the workshops and, you know, seminars that I've been a part of, which is how, how many fundamental breakthroughs are needed between here and AGI versus just scaling up the stuff that we have. And the the rough consensus answer. Now, this is among people who are certain have a certain sympathy to AI safety mm -hmm. consideration. Mm -hmm. But the consensus answer is like zero to two. We're like okay. zero to two fundamental breakthroughs away. And yeah, there are, I'm, I'm hearing fewer people say it's more than that. So that's a timeline thing. But that's kind of maybe somewhat different from 
this question of like, what's the vibe? What's the, are people yeah. freaked out? Are they excited? I'm, I'm seeing, this is just my particular vantage. And, you know, I, yeah, granted, mm-hmm. I've met a lot of these people and interviewed them, but I'm seeing a little bit of a um, tightening of the distribution where I think there, there are fewer people saying, you know, we're going to wake up one morning and everything we know about the world is going to be different. I think that's less, you know, there's less evidence that things are going that direction from from my perspective and from the, you know, the people who I know. Um, there's also less evidence for like, we don't have to worry about this. This is silliness. Um, I think, and in some ways, that's part of the story that the book tells is that the you know, the probability mass is starting to accumulate around this sense of like, this is a real thing. Um, we need to be thinking about it. But if we get our ducks in a row, then we can kind of meet the challenge. And, you know, we're seeing that effort start to happen. So is it enough? Is it fast enough? I think that's an open question. And that should leave someone a little bit worried. I certainly see it as one of the great like scientific priorities of the decade. And part of my hope is that the book can be a kind of beacon for attracting people to that area. And I think the more people who come, the the better off we'll be. Well, the book ends off where we are now, basically. So with these beginnings and some promising avenues, I've enjoyed your work quite a bit. Uh, nice job. Thanks. Thanks for the material. Thanks for the lessons and the education and, and keep it up. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.